Hey, what's up? This is another study and stream dedicated to the book Beyond Good and Evil. Today I'm gonna learn the fifth paragraph of the chapter one and uh, get deeper into a philosophical abyss, deeper into the unknown. But before I start, let me recite the previous four paragraphs. So I'm, you know, doing serious work here. I'm memorizing all this stuff, think about it all the time, not all the time, but, you know, quite often. And memorizing all these paragraphs helps me to keep my attention on all these problems, since I have to repeat them from time to time, not to forget. Anyway, the first four paragraphs, let's go on. The will to truth, the famous, uh, the will to truth, which is to tempt us to many a hazardous enterprise, the famous truthfulness of which all philosophers have hitherto spoken with respect. What questions has this will to truth not laid before us? What strange, perplexing, questionable questions? It's already a long story, yet it seems as if it were hardly commenced. Is it any wonder that we at last grow distrustful, lose patience, and turn impatiently away? That these things at last teaches us to ask questions ourselves? Who is it really that puts questions to us here? What is really this will to truth in us? In fact, we made a long halt at the question as to the origin of this will, until we at last came to an absolute standstill before a yet more fundamental question. We inquired about the value of this will. Granted that we want truth, why, why not rather untruth and uncertainty, even ignorance? The problem of the value of truth presented itself before us, or was it we who presented ourselves before the problem? It would be a rendezvous of questions and notes of interrogation. And could it be believed that it at last seems to us as if the problem had never been propounded before, as if we were the first to discern it, get a sight of it, and risk raising it? For there is risk in raising it. Perhaps there is no greater risk. How could anything originate out of its opposite? For example, truth out of error, or the will to truth out of the will to deception, or the generous deed out of selfishness, or the wise, the sun bright vision of the wise man out of covetousness. Such genesis is impossible. Whoever dreams of it is a fool, nay, worse than a fool. Things of the highest value must have a different origin, an origin of their own. In this transitory, seductive, illusory, paltry world, in this turmoil of delusion and cupidity, they cannot have their source, but rather in the lap of being, in the intransitive, in the concealed God, in the thing in itself, there must be their source and nowhere else. Such mode of reasoning discloses the typical prejudice by which metaphysicians of all times can be recognized. This mode of valuation is at the back of, their, of all their logical procedures. Through this belief of theirs, they exert themselves to their knowledge, to something that in the end fundamentally christened the truth. Solemnly christened the truth. The fundamental belief of metaphysician, metaphysicians is the belief in the antithesis of values. It never occurred even to the wariest of them to doubt here and the very threshold where doubt, however, is most necessary. Though they had made a solemn vow, the omnibus dubitandum. For it may be doubted, firstly, that the antithesis exist at all, and secondly, that the popular valuations and antithesis of values 
upon which metaphysicians have set their seals are not merely superficial estimates, merely provisional perspectives. Besides probably being made from some corner, perhaps from below, frog perspectives, as it were to borrow an expression current among painters. In spite of all the value that may belong to the truth, to the positive and the unselfish, it may be possible that a higher and more fundamental value generally for life should be assigned to pretense, to the will to delusion, to selfishness and cupidity. It might even be possible that what constitutes these good and respected things consist precisely in their being insidiously related, noted, crocheted to these evil and apparently opposed things, perhaps being essentially identical with them, perhaps. But who wishes to concern himself with such dangerous perhapses? For that investigation, one must await the advent of new order of philosophers, such as will have other tastes and inclinations. Philosophers, uh, the reverse of those prevalent hitherto, philosophers of the dangerous, perhaps, and to speak in all seriousness, I see such philosophers beginning to appear. Haven't kept a sharp eye on philosophers and haven't read between their lines for long enough. I now say to myself that the most part of conscious thinking must be counted among the instinctive functions. Even, and it is so even in the case of philosophical thinking, one has here to learn anew as one learned anew about heredity and innateness. As little as the act of birth comes into consideration in the whole process and procedure of heredity, just as little being conscious is opposed to the instinctive and any decisive sense. The most past part of conscious of the conscious thinking of a philosopher is secretly influenced by his uh, instincts and forced into definite channels behind all logic in its seeming sovereignty of movement their valuations or to speak more plainly physiological demands for the maintenance of a definite mode of life that for example that truth is more valuable than for example for example that the certain is more valuable than the uncertain, that illusion is less, what, for example, that, <laughs> for example, that uh, 
the certain is worth more than uncertain than the uncertain that illusion is less valuable than truth such valuations in spite of their regulatory importance for us might notwithstanding be only superficial valuations special kinds of stupidity such as might be necessary for the maintenance of beings such as ourselves supposing in effect that man is not only the measure of things the falseness of an opinion is not for us any objection to it it is here perhaps that our new language sounds more st strangely the question is how far is an opinion life furthering life preserving species preserving perhaps species rearing and we are fundamentally inclined to maintain that the falsest opinions to which the synthetic judgments a priori belong are the most indispensable for us that without a recognizing of logical fictions without a comparison of reality to the purely imagined world of the absolute and immutable without a constant counterfeiting of the world by means of numbers man could not live that the denunciation that the renunciation of false opinions would be a renunciation of life a negation of life to recognize untruth as a condition of life that is certainly to impugn the traditional ideas of value in a dangerous manner and philosophy which ventures to do so thereby alone thereby has alone placed itself beyond good and evil all right so this was the first four paragraphs yeah i see that there's some you know there are some difficulties here i didn't repeat this uh, no, i didn't rehearse the, fir the first three paragraphs for a week and uh, now i see that it's hard for me to fluently say them i can say the first few one then i start forgetting some parts and it takes some time to remember it but the last one since i practiced it for the entire week so at least once a day i was thinking about this paragraph remembering it trying to you know analyze what is it about so but now i can remember but yes yeah, the idea is that before recording these videos i probably need to rehearse it once again not to feel frustrated when i can't find you know the line or can't remember certain expression but anyway today i studied the fifth paragraph it seems to be twice as long as the fourth but it's not a big big deal so I, I suppose to get through this paragraph for in an hour, I don't want to spend more time than an hour. And I think it makes sense to be kind of, you know, short, not, not to get into detail and talk a lot about my personal experience, even though I want to integrate all these ideas into my personal experience and analyze them through applying them to something that i you know thought thought about before or to something that i experienced in my life i still don't want to extend it so far so i want to i want to be able to understand and and uh, analyze this paragraph just in one hour i don't want to spend more time and i don't want to talk too much about some unrelated things but anyway let's go on 
that which causes philosophers to be regarded half distrustfully and half mockingly is not the oft repeated discovery how innocent they are, how often and easily they make mistakes and lose their way, in short, how childish and childlike they are, but that there's not enough honest dealing with them, whereas they are all raise a loud and virtuous outcry when the problem of truthfulness is even hinted at the remotest manner. They all pose as though their real opinions had been discovered and attained through the self-evolving of a cold, pure, divinely indifferent dialectic, in contrast to all sorts of mystics who fairer and foolisher talk about of talk of inspiration, whereas in fact a prejudiced proposition, idea, or suggestion, which is generally their heart's desire, abstracted and refined, is defended by them with arguments sought out after the event. They all they are all advocates who do not wish to be regarded as such generally astute defenders also of their prejudices which they dub truths and very far from having the conscious which bravely admits this to itself very far from having the good taste of the courage which goes so far as to let this be understood perhaps to warn friend or foe or in chief role, confidence and self ridicule the spectacle of the tartuffery of old Kant equally stiff and decent with which he entices us into the dialectic by ways that led more correctly misled to his categorical imperative makes us fastidious one's smile we who find no small amusement in spying out the subtle tricks of old moralists and ethical preachers, or still more so, the hocus pocus in mathematical form by means of which Spinoza has, as it were, clad his philosophy in mail and mask. In fact, the love of his wisdom to translate the term fairly and squarely, in order thereby to strike a terror at once into the heart of the a silent who should dare to cast a glance on that invincible maiden, that Pallas Athena, how much of personal timidity and vulnerability does this masquerade of a skyly, sickly, resc <laughs> skyly sick that, that's nice, slipper, sickly, rescue betray. Okay, yeah, see, <laughs> like, in spite of my in spite of practicing for four years to read aloud and <laughs> you know doing it with uh, serious serious intention i mean the first time when i discovered this let's say exercise so the first time when this idea occurred to me to read books in english aloud and uh, try to understand what they are about without even being able to understand every word but no it's not about every okay so the idea the idea was that i wanted to train my english my reading skill simply by going through the text reading it aloud and doing it many times until i can understand what's uh, the meaning of the text and i wanted to also train my pronunciation and my fluency through this process i thought it was 2017 four years ago i thought that if i dedicate 10 15 20 minutes maybe an hour sometimes sometimes i was reading for two hours a day in like like that so i thought that eventually i'll be able to read as fluently as i can read in my native language and 
after four years, it's still not the case. I mean, oh, maybe it takes more time than, than that, but there are also problems with written language. I understand that it doesn't work as uh, speech. In speech, when I speak, it's uh, natural for me to use the language which can't be used when I you know, write books or read. And even though it looks much better on the paper, on the screen, when the language is written, it's still, when I read it, it feels as if I am doing kind of, you know, some kind of, <laughs> it's not real, real, real speech. I may memorize it. I may rehearse it 50 times so that it's going to be almost natural, but it's still unnatural. Whenever I repeat these paragraphs in my mind, whenever I think about these ideas, written ideas, I see the big gap between like authentic, authentic speech and something which is written on paper. But I guess there must be some kind of intention, which I had when I was studying Russian language, that finally, if uh, I do it a lot, if I read a lot, if I learn to speak in the same way as I write, since I was writing for many years, so I'll finally be able to speak almost as uh, I can write. I mean, om using the same language, the same grammar, the same syntax. And it was almost like I almost got to the point when I was using Russian language, but in English, it's still, it's terrible. I see now how, how far I am from the excellent, you know, the excellent reading, not even excellent. I mean, when I listen to audiobooks, it's uh, totally different. Yeah, and I want now, like I want just to make a comparison and uh, see how the native English speaker reads this paragraph. That's an amazing opportunity. So I might go on YouTube and find <laughs> uh, find the book and make somebody else read it. The question is, how far in a pot can humans, man could not live the creation of life, to recognize untruth as a condition of life, that is certainly to impunge the traditional ideas of value in a dangerous manner, and a philosophy which ventures to do so, has thereby alone placed itself beyond good and evil. Okay, now I'd like to see it. Like the, the difference <laughs> yeah that's what i what i want to achieve by doing this exercise i want to get to the natural you know, way of uh, reading the book natural way of reading the book anyway the idea is i want to be able to read as well as this guy for example is going to read the paragraph right now Five. that which causes philosophers to be regarded half distrustfully and half mockingly is not the oft repeated discovery of how innocent they are, how often and easily they make mistakes and lose their way in short, how childish and childlike they are, but that there is not enough honest dealing with them, whereas they all raise a loud and virtuous outcry when the problem of truthfulness is even hinted at in the remotest manner. They all pose as though their real opinions have been discovered and attained through the self evolving of a cold, pure, divinely indifferent dialectic. In contrast to all sorts of mystics who, fair and foolish, talk of inspiration. Whereas, in fact, a prejudiced proposition, idea, or suggestion, which is generally their heart's desire, abstracted and refined, is defended by them with arguments sought out after the event. They are all advocates who do not wish to be regarded as such generally astute defenders also of their prejudices, which they dub truths, and very far from having the conscience which bravely admits this to itself, very far from having the good taste of the courage, which goes so far as to let this be understood, perhaps to warn friend or foe, or in cheerful, cheerful confidence and self-reproof. 
the spectacle of the tartuffery of old puns, equally stiff and decent, with which he entices us into the dialectic byways that lead, more correctly, maybe mislead, to his categorical imperative, makes us fastidious ones smile. We who find no small amusement in spying out the subtle tricks of old moralists and ethical preachers, or still more so, the hocus pocus in mathematical form by means of which Spinoza has, as it were, clad his philosophy in male and mice. In fact, the love of his wisdom, to translate the term fairly and squarely, in order thereby to strike terror at once into the heart of the assailant, who should dare to cast a glance on the invincible maiden, that Pallas Athena. How much of personal timidity and vulnerability does this masquerade? A sickly recluse, a train. Okay, so now, like one of my other tasks which I'm working on here is to learn to read texts as well as uh, this guy was able to read it right now. So I want to reach this level. And yeah, I'm working on it for four years. I dedicate maybe. I don't know how much since I don't work on it consistently. I don't, I don't do these exercises every day, but I do them from time to time. So I may do like these exercises on a daily basis. I mean, read books and you know, improve my reading skills for months or sometimes even longer for half a year. But then I may just switch to something else and uh, do something else and forget about practicing and then came, come back and so I can say that I, I was doing it on a regular basis for four years, but essentially I would say I dedicate maybe 1000 hours uh, to say roughly to learn to read and still I'm, I see that I'm so far from the excellence. In fact, I'm just at the beginning. I, I'm not, I didn't went uh, too much further from the point where I was at the, at the 2017. Well, I definitely can do it better, but it's still it's still quite weak. And uh, of course, I can practice for a certain period of time, like let's say ten hours, just to read this one paragraph, and I'll be able to do that. Of course, I may, you know, dedicate a lot of time to one particular sentence and say it perfectly. I may imitate any native speaker, but it's not what I want. So I want to read books, new books. Initially, being able to read it, to read them as well as uh, you know, native speakers can read them. So the point is not to memorize one paragraph or a few paragraphs. The point, the point is to open a new book, read it aloud, and from the first from the first uh, time to be able to read it perfectly, or you know maybe from the second time. Anyway, so let's come to Nietzsche and see what he wants to say here. So the first sentence, uh, let me read it once again. That which causes philosophers to be regarded half distrustfully and half mockingly is not the oft repeated discovery of how innocent they are, how often and easy that they make mistakes and lose their way. In short, how childish and childlike they are, but that there is not enough honest dealing with them, whereas they all raise a loud and virtuous outcry when the problem of truthfulness is even hinted at the remotest manner. Okay, so what's going on here? Yeah, and I also want to use grammar and grammatical concepts to analyze like every sentence since now I'm studying grammar and makes a lot of sense. Anyway, so that which causes philosophers to be regarded distrustfully and half mockingly. So this is the subject of uh, the sentence, as far as I may tell. So it's not the oft repeated discovery, how innocent they are, how often and easily they make mistakes and lose their way, in short, how childish and childlike they are, but uh, that there is not enough honest dealing with them, whereas they all are raise a loud and virtuous outcry when the problem of truthfulness is even hinted at the remotest manner. So this is the predicate. <laughs> uh, there's something which uh, 
causes philosophers to be regarded half distrustfully and half mockingly. And it is not, it is not this thing, like it is not the oft repeated discovery how innocent they are, but yeah, but it's this thing, but that there is not enough honest dealing with them. And uh, I guess it's the complex sentence, and this is another clause which depends on the, this one. So whereas they all arise aloud in virtuous outcry when the problem of truthfulness is even hinted at the remotest manner. All right, so it seems to me that this sentence represents the idea that philosophers, like, you know, was writing for thousands of years and uh, their kind of suspicious, suspicious creatures, but they're not suspicious because uh, they make mistakes, but uh, because, because uh, nobody honestly analyzes uh, what makes them, you know, analyzes their truths. So here he wants to say like, whereas like, whenever you talk about philosophy, yeah, there's about language, about truth. It's, uh, you know, it seems like I want to find truth. And for me, the truth is the most important thing. But actually, uh, it's not the, the, you know, prime motivation. There's something else. And okay, when, <laughs> let's get it slowly. That which causes philosophers to be regarded half distrustfully and half mockingly. Half distrustfully and half mockingly. So if philosophers are made fun of and very few people trust them. <laughs> very few people. What the hell am I talking about? Okay. In science, can I use the word science here? So in science, philosophy is not a, not what, hard, it's not a hard science. And all, many sciences, especially hard, like cake, like physicists and mathematicians, they mock philosophers for, for what? Not for their mistakes, right? But what's going on? Honest dealing with them. But as soon as you attack a, a philosopher or truth, right? They, they, they all raise a loud and virtuous outcry when the problem of truthfulness is even hinted at the remotest manner. So the idea of truthfulness. Whenever somebody wants to analyze this concept, the philosophers raise a loud and virtuous outcry. I mean, we're talking about serious stuff. So let's suppose now I want to criticize the nature of reality and say that, you know, all this, uh, now it seems to be a common deal. So we have all these people who you know, say that reality is a simulation, there are lots of movies uh, of that kind. But uh, in 19th century, it was, it was different. And if you speak about objective reality and say that there's no objective reality, that it may be an illusion, the philosophers, well, there were some philosophers who spoke in that manner about reality, like Barclay or Hume or Kant or Schopenhauer, but Nietzsche probably, or Plato, or other, you know, other philosophers, but Nietzsche wants to reverse it. He wants to say that their truths, their ideas of uh, morality and their values, they are actually socially constructed values. So they're not real. And whenever you try to criticize philosophers and say, look, guys, you're you are doing, and especially Christian philosophers, you know, those who 
who advocated for the religion. So whenever you say, guys, you are doing some kind of, you know, <laughs> dishonesty here, counterfeiting, counterfeiting the world, saying that it, it, it ought to be in a certain way, whereas reality itself is different. Look at the reality. There are lots of violence and nature is uh, cruel and it doesn't care about anybody, it doesn't care about your morality, it doesn't care about your you know, kindness, anything. But you want to make nature obey your ideals. And uh, whenever these ideals are attacked, so imagine somebody who comes and says, you know, all these, your social values are nonsense. It's, uh, it's just uh, an illusion. It's just uh, a certain way of looking at reality. And there may be mul multiple way, multiple different ways. So you may say that um, all sorts of behavior, which now is considered uh, more respectful and uh, <sighs> useful and whatever I mean, there may be societies which live in a different way and for them our type of behavior is uh, the worst and what we consider as the worst behavior like you know being cruel and violent and do all sorts of crazy things in some societies it may be respected and evaluated and there were many societies in the past like many uh, you know <laughs> such things as uh, holy roman empire and ancient greece so th there were different values but uh, for the last in philosophers it seemed they abandoned these values nietzsche wants to say that you know all great philosophers of the past they were bounded by christian morality by the idea that you know we all must be kind we all should treat each other with, with respect we all should uh, follow a certain path it doesn't mean he wants to say that we shouldn't the idea is that at least you have to understand that it's not the only way it's just one way and it was developed by collective consciousness at certain point in history and it doesn't mean that it's going to be always uh, this way but again you must understand so now it seems that when you use language when you become an expert in language you basically may convince yourself in anything and not just yourself but imagine that you have a child let's say five years old whatever when he learns to speak and understand language so you basically may if you if you are a philosopher you may convince this child a child in anything so you may convince him that you know there are some aliens on mars or you may convince him that we live in a perfect society or you know you may do everything with like uh, you know with uh, a childish brain and uh, the problem here is that when you are a philosopher when you got to the level of nietzsche so you basically may convince the entire the entire nation since for you all population is just children so a philosopher somebody who gets the point where Nietzsche was you may you may manipulate the entire society by saying let's say you know saying anything you want to say probably now nowadays it's quite different since there's many people who are already at this level so when Nietzsche for example was writing in the end of 19th century he was the most, uh, you know, he was in one guard of uh, linguistic. He basically could use language to, to make anybody believe anything. Like Asian sophists may convince you that white is black and black is white. But now it seems that there are so many different, like, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> I, get, I think I got lost anyway. So let's get back and once again read this sentence and analyze it like the ideas uh, presented in this sentence the phrases so this is uh, as i said this is a subject and the subject has uh, you know it's kind of it's a clause since we have that there's like that which causes yeah something causes philosophers to be regarded half distrustfully and half mockingly. So this is 
This is one clause and it's used as a subject. And here we have a noun. What is the noun here? That which causes philosophers to be, yeah, it's just one, it's, it's a noun phrase, essentially. It's a noun phrase which has a verb causes which has uh, what is it a direct or indirect object which causes philosophers yeah i guess it's a direct object causes philosophers to be again another verb to be regarded half distrustfully and half mockingly uh, these are compliments, but to be regarded, yeah, I guess this is a verb, not to be, but to be regarded, and it's a passive tense, <laughs> damn it, like in grammatical terms, it's almost impossible to, you know, for me now to analyze this and make a clear sense of it. But anyway, there's something which causes philosophers to be regarded half distrustfully and half mockingly, and it is not yeah, we may replace it with it, like the whole the whole noun phrase, we may replace it with it and say it is not the oft repeated discovery how innocent they are. Oft repeated. What's the word oft means? Let's check it out. Often, does it mean often? So I may guess it means often, but Let's check it. Yeah, often. Is it old fashioned way? Literally, of oft, oft repeated, oft quoted. Oft repeated advice. Oft repeated. It's not oft repeated discovery. How innocent they are. How often, yeah, and there's like how innocent they are. And there's a relative clause which uh, describes like why they're innocent, like which describes this phrase. So it is not the oft repeated discovery how innocent they are. All this is uh, it's a noun. It it's an object, and this is relative clause. How often and easily they make mistakes and lose their way. In short, how childish and childlike they are. But that there is not enough honest dealing with them. There's not enough honest dealing with them. So it is not the oft repeated discovery how innocent they are, but that there is not enough honest dealing with them. Whereas they all arise aloud and virtuous outcry when the problem of truthfulness is even hinted at the remotest manner. Yeah, I'm trying to find an example which uh, is going to help me to understand this, uh, this sentence. So there must be something, something, <laughs> yeah, I think I have to think about it more. I mean, I can find an example, but I don't want to waste uh, too much time. When I'm going to memorize this uh, paragraph, I, I'll certainly find some example and probably say it later next time. Anyway, they they all pose as though their real opinions had been discovered and attained through the self-evolving of a cold, pure, divi divinely, divinely, what the correct pronunciation, divinely. Divine, divinely. Divine, but divinely. Okay, let's use this guy. Or still more so, the hocus pocus in that to itself. Very far from having the good taste of the courage, which got all pose as though their real opinions had been discovered and attained through the self evolving of a cold, pure, divinely indifferent dialectic. Divinely, okay. They all pose as though their real opinions have been discovered and attained through the self-evolving 
through the, through the self evolving of a cold, pure, divinely indifferent dialectic, in contrast to all sorts of mystics who fair and foolisher talk of inspiration. Whereas, in fact, a prejudiced proposition, idea, or suggestion, which is generally their heart's desire, abstracted and refined, is defended by them with arguments sought out after the event. Okay, I don't want to get a grammatical analysis of this sentence. Uh, rather, I'd like to describe what I, how, how I understand it, how I understand it. So they pretend that uh, all, all their arguments, all their ideas, all their knowledge was derived by logical methods, by special scientific methodology. And whatever they want to prove, they want to prove the truth, that this is truth. And essentially, we are arguing here about the relationship between the language and uh, the reality. And philosophers uh, seemed to present us with, seemed to be, no, seemed to present us with accounts of reality and saying that this is what's real, this is what's true, this is what's going on. And uh, yeah, the, the problem is, of course, you can't use, you, you can't use all sorts of different languages. So we might use a, Russian language, and uh, if uh, you speak Russian language, let, let make, let's make an example. В данный момент я могу использовать русский язык, и что бы я ни сказал, сейчас не имеет никакого значения для того, кто не понимает русский язык. Для анг англоязычного слушателя это будет звучать совершенно как какая-то пустая бессмыслица, в то время как для меня я могу использовать огромную систему понятий и создать представление о мире, которое будет иметь прямое отношение к окружающему миру и, и который может быть воспринят любым человеком, который хорошо знает русский язык. То есть в данном случае, если я говорю на русском языке, это не имеет никакого смысла для англоговорящего человека. Если мы говорим про описание мира, мы можем использовать любой язык, мы можем также отбросить любой язык и начать изучать любой другой язык и построить новую систему понятий, которая может не совпадать с той системой, которая была развита прежде в других языках. Окей, okay, now I shift, to, I shift back to English since, you know, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was it was funny experiment. So the, the idea was what I tried to say that is uh, no matter which kind of science you create by using one language, there may be a different science created in another language and it may describe the reality in its own terms. And there may be a con like infinite arguments about what's true, what's false. And language, it seems to be impossible to find the perfect way of, to, since it's all, yeah, there's uh, such uh, categories as uh, ontologically, uh, not epistemologically objective and epistemologically subjective, and language itself uh, fits into the category of epistemologically subjective, as far as I can understand it right now. So the idea is that you use language, but essentially just words, it's just sounds. They make sense only to those who know these sounds, but in reality, and in ontological level, it doesn't make any sense at all. And since, and, and hence we may use any other language to describe reality and say that this is true and this is false. But the philosophers, they want to say, no, look, there's a certain relation between language and reality, logic, for example. They use logic and say, it doesn't matter what kind of language you use. There is logic and language must be logical. And if it's logical, it's true. If it's not logical, it's not true. You can contradict yourself. You can say that P and uh, later not P. If there's P, if P or, you know, su such logic as, uh, you know, whatever, deduction, <laughs> induction. So you may say uh, P is Q and Q is uh, W. And therefore P is W or, you know, like mathematics, the idea to find some, mathematical methods, apply them to language and uh, say that this subjective objective way of looking at the reality. And again, what Misha want to say? So the, he says, no, it's all like you're not looking for truth. What you're looking for is your intentions, your ideas or he uses suggestions, propositions, pre a prejudice proposition, an idea or suggestion. So he says, you may have an idea, 
let's say, you may have an idea that uh, all people must be kind and that kindness will essentially lead us to paradise. Let's suppose that we uh, create a utopia where all people are kind to each other and there is no violence, there is no hatred, everybody lives in amazing, you know, community where all people are smiling, watch the uh, episode of Black Mirror when we have this, you know, what is it called? There was a girl and she was in this strange world. I forgot the name of the episode. But anyway, so they always confirm each other's status by, you know, smiling to each other and saying something good. And whenever you say something bad, like you lose your status and it, uh, it uh, removes all benefits or social benefits that you may have if you have a higher status and all people instead of you know working for money they all try to do something to uh, to enhance their status and status play the crucial role in social you know, organization something what's going on in china already and probably something which is gonna which is gonna appear sooner or later in there as as a as a replacement of uh, capitalist societies where people pursue you know these goals when they want to be rich and and what just to reach it's enough so anyway this idea that you may have uh, all people must be kind so it it's not true it's not uh, something that refers to nature or to something like fundamental natural laws it's just an idea but then you may say no let's suppose that it's true it's a fundamental thing which uh, is uh, crucial for social development which is crucial for our communities for good life so we must find this you know kindness let's say we all must be kind and then you may uh, develop the entire philosophical system based on this idea so essentially what you can do you may sit at you know at the computer uh, read some books and Proof that it is true, trying to present all sorts of sciences and all sorts of ideas, all, all sorts of you know, philosophical works, trying to combine them in a way that they will show that your idea is true. Or you may say, you know, there's again, the reality is an illusion, and you may go on in this direction and prove that this is an illusion. And you may convince yourself that's the problem. You don't see that it's only the feature of the brain to find something and create some sorts of you know philosophical ideas based on this belief or idea or intention and that's really dangerous since whenever no now we live, it's the uh, beginning of I, all sorts of ideologies so we we'll take marxism and say okay all people there's like class struggle and there's different classes and all in every society there's people who possess the means of production and people who possess nothing and you know the idea of uh, the ideology the marxism is based on uh, giving power to proletariat the proletariat uh, gains its power by becoming conscious of the uh, situation where the proletariat is and uh, overthrowing the capitalists who possessed money and create all sorts of philosophies and ideologies to keep uh, proletariat uh, you know <laughs> what not revol revolving against uh, the capitalists so now imagine i have you know i already i already uh, talked about this idea i don't remember probably it was in the first or in the second podcast or not post study and stream so there was an idea that if i have uh, like <laughs> billions of uh, you know dollars I may do whatever I want, right? And I may basically hire a bunch of philosophers and say, and I'm a capitalist. Of course, there's people who are hungry and they don't have money and they don't have anything. And if we live in the same society, if we live in the same house, of course, it's not going to be you know, safe for me since I have millions and people have nothing. And so I may hire the best uh, you know, guys who live with me and Make, make make an army to protect my you know my possessions my property but i also may hire some smart guys who will write certain philosophies who will write certain you know texts novels whatever books and teach uh, those people who are 
who are in fear, who doesn't have anything, that this is uh, the best way of living. This is, you know, it's not good to be rich, it's good to be poor. And if you are poor, you will be happy after in the afterlife. So you may go to heaven and you don't need to evolve. You don't need to uh, try. You, you may try to be, you know, to be rich. But the idea here, there, like, no matter how much you try, there are people who are richer than you. <laughs> and you can, yeah, and if you are the richest person, of course, uh, it, does, like, it doesn't mean that you are, okay, the idea. I have lots of money. I invest this money into developing my ideology. And this ideology basically based on my mode of existence. I want to preserve this mode of existence. And if I see like this uh, crowd as uh, the threat to my existence, I may hire certain people who will, you know, develop ideologists and make these people not, uh, make these people basically obey the law and follow certain rules and live in certain way of life. And this, again, one ideology, uh, there may be other ideologies like you know, capitalism, it's uh, an opposite ideology. We'll say there's free market, everybody is free. You may try something. If, you, if it doesn't work, it's uh, you who you may blame. It's not, it's not the society, it's not the um, rich people. It's all up to you. Everybody may be rich. There are lots of stories, actually countless stories, like American dream. So. The guy uh, was born in a poor family. Then he became, you know, a good guy, followed all the rules and by, or not didn't follow the rules, doesn't matter. Eventually he made himself, he earned like short capital, then invested it and became rich and famous. And now he look at him, he is such a good person. And there's infinite stories like that, infinite movies like that. You may watch and say, yeah, that's what's going on in capitalism. That's what I want to be. That's all possible. But uh, if you look at the structure, not at what's going on right now or in movies, but look at the structure. The structure is always the same. So there's some guys on top and there's huge uh, amount of people at the bottom. And yeah, some guys, uh, you know, race from the bottom to the top, but essentially they are, you know, this, those who, who remain there, they always like 80% of people who are, you know, who are poor, relatively to those who are on the top and there's no way to change it you may of course rise at the top but <laughs> you still it is still it still wouldn't change anything for this 80 percent that's the idea and communist uh society like ideology or yeah communist ideology marxism they want to say no let's uh, just uh, make everybody equal let's uh Let's uh, kill all those who are on the top and uh, make everybody equal. But yes, even if it's you know, appealing to the masses, it seems to be a kind of, <laughs> kind of, well, it may work, but you see, the, I want to like, present the idea. Let's suppose I'm a philosopher now, and I, uh, I'm convinced that uh, communism or capitalism or fascism, fascism or liberalism or whatever ideology is the best ideology. What am I doing? I'm trying to develop it. How I develop it? I write about, I write books about it. I find the best books written before. I analyze them. I find the common features and write other books, trying to uh, spread these ideologies, spread these ideas around the world. And uh, by doing that, I convince myself that this is the best way, you know, to <laughs> to live, to be, to exist, whatever. But the problem with philosophers, they don't say so. They don't say, oh, I have this idea, and it seems to me that this is an amazing idea, and I want to develop it. I want to write my philosophies uh, and dedicate them to, yeah, they have the idea. It's truth. <laughs> what is truth? Then <laughs> Nisha says, let's, let, let's question the truth itself. And so, no, truth, it, it can't be questioned. So if you have an idea of truth, you must be you know, truthful, let's say. And everybody must be truthful. Everybody must speak truth. But Nietzsche says, no, it's like, look at the reality. If everybody speaks truth, there is no way. It's like a fundamental condition of life is uh, untruth. Without untruth, there is no truth. 
And that's the problem. But again, philosophers was the problem with philosophers. So they, most of them believed, as Nietzsche points out, that they discovered truth. And all their philosophers, philosophies, all their writings and ideas, uh, they were dedicated to the truth itself. Whereas Nietzsche says, no, it's just one instinct which uh, philosophizes inside, inside of you, which say, like it may be, you know, cupidity, it may be uh, covetousness, it may be uh, avarice, whatever, whatever, whatever the hell may philosophize inside of a philosopher. So it may be lust, it may be a desire to have power, desire to have, you know, money, sex, whatever you want to wanna have. And you convince yourself, no, it's not true. What I want, what I want is truth. Yeah. And then you see that the root of the problem where it arises. Okay, let me read it once again. They all pose us though their real opinions had been discovered and attained through self-evolving of a cold, pure, divinely indifferent dialectic. So real opinions had been discovered through dialectic. Socrates is like all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is a, therefore Socrates is mortal. Pure dialectic. Then we write a, like all people, you know, <laughs> suffer, like pay, 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 pain is uh, bad. Let's say, you know, it sounds quite strange. Anyway, pain is bad. Uh, people have pain. No, no, it's a bad argument. Let me con construct a better one. So, okay, pain is bad. When we feel pain, we don't want to feel pain. Uh, <laughs> like, let's eliminate pain. Let's eliminate suffering from the world. Let's make the world uh, happy <laughs> and let's make everybody happy. But for Nietzsche, he says, no, pain, suffering, it's one of his ideas and uh, I guess it wasn't his ideas. It was presented in Schopenhauer and before it was presented in Buddhist philosophy. So the idea is that suffering actually is the key. So if you want to uh, get sense of what reality is, you have to suffer. The more you suffer, the better you understand what, what's, what, what does it mean to be real. And most of your real experience is based on suffering, not on happiness. But whenever you are happy, you forget about it and few you know few weeks few months few years but if you experience real suffering real pain you remember it forever so i uh, broke my leg when i was four years old i jumped from the ladder at the kitchen garden to prove that i am you know the uh, bravest man <laughs> there was the ladder we played the game and uh, you know the rules were like who who jumps from the higher 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 stair he wins and i got at the top and jumped from the top and broke my leg and <laughs> yeah i remember it, it was painful i went to the restroom and sat there for half an hour crying and i didn't want to show my you know my weakness my cry and uh, so it was terrible suffering and now i'm 30 35 and i still remember it as if it, as if it happened yesterday i mean i remember this moment i have a clear picture of my suffering sitting at the restroom crying of i don't remember people i don't remember these kids like their you know names how they looked i don't remember the kindergarten itself but i remember emotions i remember myself like crying and uh, you know feeling pain and also i remember the whole, the whole experience and i also remember what happened afterwards when I was discovered by nurses and they called an emergency and there was like a doctor, not doctors, but you know, these guys who, uh, who come to get you to the hospital and they put me on, a, what's the word for that? Okay, they, they put me on some, <laughs> don't know the word. Anyway, on some, uh, and some thin and uh, carried me through the kindergarten into the emergency car 
and uh, while I was scared out by these guys, I was so proud that they were like of myself. I, I wasn't so proud, but I also remember this feeling when everybody looked at me and everybody uh, sympathized with my pain or shared some compassion. And it was a joyful experience at the same time. So it was painful, but then everybody, everybody like uh, looked at me with such a, you know, such a, I don't know how to describe it. So the idea, once again, suffering, I remember it from, you know, it's like 30, 30, 31 year past and I still remember it. But I had lots of, uh, you know, happy moments in my life. And most of them I forget. Of course, there are some of them I can, I can still remember. But the point is like suffering, again, the idea, you may want to eliminate this idea from the real world. But without pain, without suffering, there's no real life. It's all going to be just a stupid video game. So pain makes reality real. But yeah, it may be just an idea. It may be just nonsense. Who cares? So what he says here, yeah, and I have just 10 minutes to finish this paragraph. So let's speed up. They all pose as though their real opinions had been discovered and attained through self-evolving of a cold, pure, divinely indifferent dialectic, in contrast to all sorts of mystics who fear and foolisher talk of inspiration. Whereas, in fact, a prejudice, proposition, idea, or suggestion, which is generally their heart's desire, abstracted and refined, is defended by them with arguments sought out after the event. Okay, they all are advocates who do not wish to be regarded as such, generally astute defenders also of their prejudices, which they dub truths, and very far from having the conscious which bravely admits this to itself, very far from having the good taste of the courage which goes, to, which goes so far as to let this be understood, perhaps to warn friend or foe, or in cheerful confidence and self-ridicule. All right. So they all are advocates who, you know, he Nietzsche just stresses uh, this point, he says, he uses the words, like phrases, advocates who do not wish to be regarded as such generally astute defenders also of their prejudices yeah defenders of their prejudices which they dub truths very far from having the conscious which bravely admits this to itself so they have no enough self-criticism they believe that they follow truth they believe that truth is something real that it exists and it uh, motivates them to you know do what they do to think, to develop certain ideas, to prove something. But, uh, and they never question it. That's the, that's the problem. So you never question your motivation. You never question why you do what you do. So you may be a great philosopher like Kant, and you may believe in categorical imperative and say, everybody must do that. You have to behave in a way as your behavior must be a, uh, law like a universal law for all people to do the same and again like we may say is it does it make sense well it makes sense of course Kant doesn't tell you do x y and z he tells you just look inside yourself there's moral law you have to obey and by obeying this you actually become stronger you develop self-control you learn to control your emotions you learn to be independent from your emotions you develop kind of soul like a, it's like a metaphor if we use the word soul as a metaphor categorical imperative so and uh, then we say that this is true this is uh, morality or you know this motivation this is the one which uh, is absolute and the world itself provides you with this motivation as soon as you open your eyes. But Nish says, no, it's one of the 
countless motivations, countless. There are infinite instincts build it in us. And we follow these instincts and these instincts may philosophize and write books and may be suppressed and, you know, cause all sorts of problems. And understand it, the problem is it's never, it's never, it's never fulfilling. The point with understanding is that you can't understand something like i'm a let's say i'm a determinist or i was a determinist for you know, three years since 2012 till 2015 until i discovered sex empiricus i basically developed this idea of determinism and i was thinking about it a lot i mean all my conscious life was centered around this idea i was writing daily notes for three years and they reflect this uh, conscious state of mind so i was thinking about amor, amor, amor fatia basically everything what i'm doing is determined by my previous actions and since i can't go back and change something in the past i can't change anything in the future and whatever i'm doing right now it's all determined by you know by the universe itself since and uh, hence there's no there's no such thing as the self there's no free will and it's actually liberating and i was so funny to discover this idea and i was like writing my you know, diaries and uh, writing some books and you know some articles philosophical philosophical reflections and poetry just to express this idea since around me whenever i discuss this idea with people nobody could understand me there were some people who could who could have a hint of what was up uh, on my mind but essentially all conversations led to the point where you know people say yeah it makes sense but uh, you know it seems that free will and you know all sorts of freedom freedoms are like, all people believe in that why should you question this and later of course when i started you know studying philosophy in depth i was trying to uh, study something that confirm confirmed my belief that uh, free will is an illusion determinism is true nobody understands it everybody are is a fool like all people are dumb since they don't see what's going on they believe in their own free will whereas it's just an illusion and i was thinking about it for many years and sex empirical skepticism helped me to refute this idea now i see that there's like uh, now i see I, I would say i don't know exactly <laughs> i i'm still uh, try to defend determinism so whenever i have conversations about the difference between free will and determinism i say yeah, it may be both but this is my side so i choose uh, to be a determinist since uh, for me it's more more logical more you know it's better position uh but i i i, I uh i'm tolerant if you want to you know believe in free will that's up to you i'm not gonna try to convince you even though yeah i'm gonna try but uh, it's actually not my you know prime motivation and I'm trying now to understand like these ideas about free will. Now I'm watching the course of lecture by John Searle, and he is he, he is not an advert. Like it seems that we have a similar understanding of reality, but he is on the opposite side. So he thinks that you no, know, it's better to believe in free will. So there's determinism, there's free will. He can't explain it. He he, but he advocates for free will instead of advocating for determinism. And he takes the side of, uh, you know, those people who, who really believe in free will, whereas I uh, take the opposite side. But still his ideas, yeah, I, I really like, I really like to listen to him. And uh, yeah, but anyway, truth, yeah, very far from having understood, blah, blah, blah. Let's read it once again. They all are advocates who do not wish to be regarded as such generalized youth defenders also of their prejudices which they adopt truth truths and very far from having the conscience which braille admits this to itself very far from having the good taste of the courage which goes to which goes so far as to let this be understood perhaps to warn friend or foe or in cheerful confidence and self ridicule i like these words cheerful confidence and self ridicule <laughs> Okay, uh, now my time is already uh, is already over. But yeah, I, of course I can quit at the 
middle. So I have I have to go fast and read these per these few few more sentences. Just read them and you know, try to make sense of them for five ten minutes. I guess I have this five ten extra minutes. The spectacle of the tartuffery of old Kant, equally stiff and decent, with which he entices us into the dialectic byways that led, more correctly misled, to his categorical imperative, makes us fastidious once smile. We who find no small amusement in spying out the subtle tricks of all old moralists and ethical preachers. Okay, the spectacle of the tertiary of old Kant to the idea is that you know, Nietzsche mocks Kant very strongly. I mean, after reading Kant, like seriously studying Kant and then discovering Nietzsche, it's very hard to get back to Kant. Well, I read seven volumes of Kant. Uh, I took from library seven volumes of his collected works. Three of them were most famous, uh, you know, books like the Critique of the Reason, the Critique of uh, I don't know how to translate translate it precisely in English, but it seems to Critique of uh, a Practical Reason and to Critique of uh, the Critique of the Ability of Judgment, and other books like his uh, first published books about the nature of the universe about the solar system and some notes. Uh, the metaf his, uh, metaphysics is one of his uh, also famous books, Pro Prolegomens to a Future Metaphysics. I don't remember all of them, but I remember that after reading Kant, like these seven volumes, I discovered Nietzsche and I was very happy to see how he criticizes Kant. And I, I believed Kant too much <laughs> when I was, you know, I was under influence of Kant for half a year. And studied the first book, uh, the Critique of Pure Reason, in depth for a couple of months, until I came to the conclusion that now I know everything about things and themselves, and there's no need to, you know, read everything further to analyze everything in depth further. Yeah, I, I want to reread the Critique of Pure Reason in uh, near future. I guess when I finish with uh, this guy John Searle, so now I have to watch a few more courses of lectures. One is the philosophy of mind and the other is the philosophy of society. I hope I'll be able to watch these lectures at the end of uh, the summer. And later I probably will get back to Kant since he criticizes Kant and says that, you know, he basically obtained Nietzschean ideas, John Searle, he says, which expressed here, like, but not, not absolute skepticism, but what he says here, Nietzsche is basically the same what John Searle would say, that this... Uh, idea with things in themselves and uh, you know it's uh, just uh, all it's all it's all wrong and it was a disaster naive realism was the best <laughs> way of looking at reality and it, since it was rejected by academia and by you know science we had lots of problems that's the john searle's point of view and i'm not going into details here but again the tartuffery of old Kant. Yeah, I like I, I like this phrase, so I guess you know I'll, I'm going to memorize this paragraph. And later, if I have some discussions about Kant, it's very funny to use some of them. And say, no, listen to what Nietzsche said about Kant. <laughs> like how how would you how would you interpret that? Yeah, but Nietzsche admired Kant, even though he criticizes him a lot. Yeah, it's, there's huge influence on Nietzsche was made by Kant, and he knew Kant. Well, well, he read, he read not only his critique of tourism but other books as well. Well, here Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer, like after reading five, six volumes, ten volumes of Schopenhauer, it's almost impossible to to dismiss Kant or to you know, not 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 look at Kant, not read his books, at least his main books. And since Nietzsche was under influence of Schopenhauer, I may suppose that he not just knew Kant, but he read critique of tourism and reread it many times and read also other Kantian books as well. Okay, uh, the spectacle of the tartuffery of old Kant, equally stiff and decent, with which he entices us into the dialectic by ways that lead, more correctly mislead, to his categorical imperative, makes us fastidious one smile. Fastidious. What fastidious means? 
to something related to taste fastidious very careful about small no not taste very careful about small details in your appearance work etc meticulous yeah fastidious i like this word fastidious 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 makes us fastidious one's smile we who find no small amusement in spying out the subtle tricks of old moralists and ethical preachers so Nietzsche attacks here the idea of more like basically the Christian ideas of uh, moral philosophy objective morality and things like that or still more so the hocus pocus in mathematical form by means of which Spinoza has as it were clad his philosophy in male and mask in fact the love of his wisdom to translate the term fairly and squarely in order thereby to strike terror at once into the heart of the assailant who should dare to cast a glance on that invincible maiden that palace athena how much of personal timidity and vulnerability does this masquerade of a sickly rescue betray sickly recluse recluse what this word mean recluse someone who chooses to live alone and does not like seeing or talking to other people recluse recluse yeah i like this word it's about my it's about me <laughs> that's what i'm yeah it's kind of now we have a modern like a contemporary term for that it's an introvert but recluse sounds much better yeah nietzsche calls uh, spinoza sickly recluse and his philosophy his love of his wisdom like the palace athena it's just an attempt to prove that you know this type of life which spinoza choose was uh, you know <laughs> justifiable by the truth by philosophy by mathematics yeah i've read spinoza the ethics i read it many times i guess the last yeah i start the last time i read it 2015 before i like when i shifted to english i stopped reading all philosophical works but when i was studying russian it was my you know passion i could read books so like very fast philosophical books it took me a few weeks to read uh, like five books for example 2012 yeah now i'm struggling with john searle and it takes me weeks to get just the one book whereas recently i remembered this experience i was it was 2012 when i discovered Feuerbach, Fichte and, and Schopenhauer and I was so so inspired by their work so it, they made me feel amazing and uh, I could read five books like two books of Fichte one book book one book of uh, two books of Feuerbach and one book of Schopenhauer like five books I read in two weeks and it was amazing i was wow that's so powerful and now i compare it with what i'm doing right like nowadays struggling with english and you know being unable to understand most of most of what i read and it makes me feel you know yeah, it motivates me to go further since uh, like five years of such work and i'll be able to read beyond good and evil in one day or in a few days but yeah the idea with spinoza's uh, ethics so i enjoyed to read certain books uh, once a year like over and over and ethics i tried to read it like three or four times i remember the first time it was terrible but then i uh, made few notes about his ethics i don't remember what was the year 2014 or 13. yeah i got to the second part of the book and i made a note in my diary that whenever next time i'm going to read spinoza it's essential to get to this point so it may be dull, it may be, you know, mis I, I may be, I may be bored, but I still have to go on until I get to this second chapter or third chapter, whenever, when he talked, talked about uh, probably determinism or something like that. So I have to get to this place since it's all, it's all worth uh, to get through all this boredom to get finally to this place, which uh, makes a lot of sense and which, uh, which made me you know to recognize something that i couldn't recognize before anyway once again spinoza so he basically mocks here kant and spinoza like in the first in the first uh, part of the paragraph he 
suggests that uh, we, like philosophers, often, you know, don't know ourselves. And when we talk about truth, yeah, when we try to attack the concept, when somebody tries to attack the concept of truth, philosophers uh, rise aloud and virtuous outcry. Yeah, and but they they themselves are, you know, deluded by certain motives and certain ideas. So their their basic motivation is not the like seeking truth, the philosophy, the love of wisdom. It's something. It, it may be so, but essentially. Uh, it may be something else as well. And the first, uh, again, the first part of the paragraph, he uh, basically describes this. He says that we have instincts and these instincts influence our logic, our reasoning. So in all our reasoning is, uh, and it was the previous paragraph when he discussed uh, the instinctive functions, like the third paragraph. So our instincts dictate our thoughts. And uh, Ian John Searle, this idea was uh, developed further. He says like, behind our language, there is intentionality and language stems out of intentionality. And the theory of speech acts, I guess it may be understood through these, uh, you know, these ideas much better. Essentially we have intentions, we have certain motives, we have instincts which are, aren't, aren't rational since we can't uh, really find the, you know, there are many instincts. Well, they may be right, we we'll try to rationalize them. That's the idea. But we can't never reach the point when we can say it. Now we understand that completely ourselves. We understand each of our motives and we know everything. Since there's time, <laughs> you know, goes on. Whenever I know today, tomorrow, I'm going encounter a new experience, new ideas, which may change my mind. And if I am, if I am stubborn, if I prefer to believe that there is certain truth and this is an absolute truth and everything else is just its uh, extension, yeah, I may miss lots of other things which may be presented to me by the reality itself. Anyway, in the second part, yeah, he mocks uh, Kant and Spinoza. So he gives examples of Kant and Spinoza to stress the first part, which was uh, basically an attack on philosophers who believe in true and and uh, justify their mistakes and their you know wanderings philosophical wanderings by saying that they want to know the truth he says no they want they don't want to know the truth they pretend that they want to know the truth but in reality they have certain they want to preserve a certain mode of being they want to preserve a certain lifestyle and they write books and all this logic is only an attempt to live in a certain way. Maybe alone, like Spinoza, yeah, alone, alone out of the people that write, write books and be, you know, be completely, completely satisfied with your life. Or maybe like Kant, you know, to teach philosophy, to teach, to teach students uh, and develop some ideas like categorical imperatives or synthetic, you know, judgments a priori. Anyway, that's that's it. That's it. I've gone, I've gone through the fifth paragraph. I'm going to memorize it today, maybe day, maybe yes, maybe, maybe tomorrow, maybe, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, last time I memorized this one just in, in half an hour. So I went, after I finished the previous, the previous studying stream, I went uh, to the store to buy food. And on the way there, I memorized this bloody paragraph. And then I repeated it five, six times. And now I know it. I know it and I recite it from my memory. And uh, this one seems to be bigger. And I, I guess it's going to take me more than half an hour. And I don't want to memorize it at once. I don't want to, you know, put so much effort to it. I can memorize it at once. It'll take one hour, maybe one hour and 20 minutes. But I want to divide it in two parts. So I guess the first part, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So the first part is going to be this one when he provides an argument. And the, the second part is going to be uh, those, those examples with Kant and Spinoza. So I'm going to memorize it today. This I'm going to memorize tomorrow. And uh, then it's like Friday, 
Thursday, Friday, and then probably next uh, three, four, five days, I'll you know, learn it by heart <laughs> and then go on, you know, next time when I'm going to record a study and stream, I'll start from, from again, reciting first uh, five paragraphs, and then I'm going to go on and read the second, the sixth one. For now, that's it. See you next time. <laughs>